Welcome to uh, the Fall 2021 reboot of the FODC webinar. We'll be moving towards a weekly format. Um, and so we're going to start off the seminar series for the fall. Our first speaker will be uh, Devarat Shah. Uh, Devarat uh, is a professor with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His current research interests are at the interface of statistical inference and social data processing. His work has been recognized through prize paper awards in machine learning, operations research, and computer science, as well as career prizes, including 2010 Erlang Prize from the Informs Applied Probability Society and the 2008 ACM Sigmetrics Rising Star Award. In addition, he is a, a distinguished monk, young alumni of his alma mater, IIT Bombay. So I'll let you uh, go ahead and talk about um, your talk on synthetic intervention. Uh, Angela and Francisco, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, um, please feel free to stop me at any point of time. There's a, uh, uh, I can see everybody on my Zoom screen. So you can unmute yourself and ask questions. If you feel like you want to ask questions a little silently, feel free to type it in chat and I will try to monitor it to the extent I can. So this is a um, uh, talk on synthetic interventions. As the talk progresses, I'll make it clear what this is. Uh, it's primarily method for uh, uh, counterfactual predictions uh, using both experimental and observational data. Uh, the manuscript is available here on archive. Uh, this is based on joint work with Anish Agarwal and Dennis Shen. So Anish uh, and Dennis, uh, uh, both uh, graduate students at MIT, Dennis graduated and now he's currently at Berkeley. Uh, there are, uh, there's a paper on causal tensor completion that is working a uh, paper with my colleague Alberto Abadi and Anish and Dennis. Um, uh, some of the aspects of this talk closer to the end, we'll try to touch upon that. And there's a companion paper on causal uh, matrix completion uh, with uh, Munzer Dale, another of my colleague, in addition to Anish and Dennis, that's available here. Uh, I will not end up touching upon that, but uh, some of you, it might be of interest. Okay, so here is the outline for my talk. Um, I want to start with a very simple question. A simple question is about designing data efficient randomized control experiment for identifying personalized treatment. Uh, I'll set the question, set the data, uh, etc., and we'll go through in detail uh, what the question is. Then I will present the method to answer the question, uh, synthetic intervention, and that's how I'll introduce it. Once we understand that, uh, I would like to spend some time explaining when and why does the synthetic intervention method work. Uh, in particular, I would introduce the uh, causal framework under which we'll uh, discuss various uh, formal results. And I would like to spend some time uh, discussing both the framework and the results, uh, their implications in terms of uh, experimental design uh, that implication of how does one go and verify these uh, causal assumptions behind uh, uh, that sort of enable these kind of methods. Uh, finally, in the time that permits, I would try to uh, discuss um, uh, the causal framework that emerges as causal tensor estimation. What else does it uh, enable? Uh, in particular, to talk about uh, regression discontinuity design. Uh, uh, how can this be? Uh, utilized to estimate not just mean, uh, but uh, moments of the uh, distribution, moment of potential outcomes distribution, as well as uh, utilize its structure across time for doing uh, causal forecasting. Finally, the one thing that sort of, I hope I communicate uh, through this uh, uh, talk about my excitement of uh, me being an engineer and sort of causal inference traditionally living uh, not necessarily in the engineering, feel it's a great time for these two things to come together. Uh, many in the screen actually do that. Uh, so that's fantastic. FODC as, uh, as a program has, uh, uh, has a pillar on causal inference where sort of both uh, uh, traditional statisticians as well as engineers are coming together on a variety of topics. Um, and the way I think about it in sense why this is a great time and uh, need time is because um, it is historically, as I was growing up as a graduate student, um, 
you know, uh, as a communications queuing theory person, I had access to these beautiful models that helped me reason about system design algorithms protocols. Uh, as we are moving into the modern world, there's a lot more data is collected, but also the environments are becoming messier, like data centers. So models are not clear. Okay. So really, we have lots of observed data from which we want to build simulator rather than model. And this is the question of uh, counterfactual predictions, not just predictions. Okay. And that's why sort of uh, the right causal reasoning and methods are needed. But that's why I feel that this is really exciting. This is way in uh, economics and econometrics, uh, credibility revolution sort of changed the way fields were from last four decades. I think this is uh, the engineering engineering credibility revolution that has to happen. All right, with that, let's get to the simple question first. Okay, uh, so question. Okay, so here's a question. So this work is done with, uh, in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company. Uh, for a variety of reasons right now, it's anonymous. Ho uh, hopefully we'll put out the manuscript soon. Um, it's, uh, we utilized a phase three clinical trial data from this pharmaceutical company that was collected over a period of 18 months. Uh, in this clinical trial, there were uh, 1,162 patients. Each patient was given one of the four drugs. Okay, so let's call it drug zero, one, two, and three. Uh, patients were assigned at random, but of course not uniformly. And that's why this was the assignment or distribution or empirical distribution of who got which drug. Among these, because this was a long trial, um, some of the patients actually completed the trial versus some dropped out, okay? And in these kind of trials, people drop out because of just uh, um, reasons that have nothing to do with uh, the outcomes. And sometimes the reasons that have something to do with outcome. And as you can see in this case, roughly quarter of people actually dropped out. So only 75% or so remained in the trial. So there was a significant fraction of uh, uh, people did drop out. Those who completed, we had five clinical measurements from them measured over time. Okay. And the quantity that was measured or clinical measurement, uh, smaller the better. Okay. So think of blood sugar, smaller the better in general. Uh, in that sense, uh, whatever clinical measurement was here is smaller the better. So really the interest was, can we sort of ha have a reduction or can we sort of keep it from least amount of increase? Okay. And at the end of it, among compliers, the efficacy was reported here on this right column. Okay. And of course, as you can see, the drug two had the uh, highest mean difference or best outcome in terms of uh, reduction, but of course standard deviation was too high. Standard deviation is too high for everyone to sort of uh, conclude significantly um, or conclusively which one of these is the best outcome. Now there are a few things here, right? One is there is definitely a bias because of dropout okay. and that needs to be corrected. But even before that, one could ask question, maybe something like Simpson's paradox is here at play. Maybe while overall we are not able to say because variance is too high, so maybe if we had personalized understanding of these treatments, we might be able to get more out of it. Okay. Uh, putting it other way, uh, one question one can ask is, well, in this case, what would be the personalization? Well, as it happens in this clinical trial, we had four covariates that were measured before any treatment started for every enrolled enro patient. Uh, two of them were clinical measurements and the two other were just simple age and gender. Okay. Now, using this uh, four covariates for every patient, we could uh, just run a simple clustering algorithm and there's a nice natural clustering happens. And here we're just plotting visualization of this um, uh, using uh, uh, PCA by looking at the sort of top two components. And that sort of just shows it nicely clustered. Okay, so a refined question would be that, well, uh, we've got six patient type now, okay? And we've got four treatments, okay? So can we say that for 
each patient type, which of the four treatment is the best? So that's now refined personalized question. Okay. Uh, putting it other way, what we really want to do is the following. We want to understand for each drug type and each of the patient type, understand what are the effects of the treatment on that uh, treatment on that patient group and use this refined information to understand whether we can say, well, drug one is best for type one and drug three is best for type five, five and so on. And maybe hopefully the, 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 the means would be far apart as well as the standard deviations would be small. So that we can sort of conclude uh, in a conclusive manner. And that might be also a type of thing you would see in the setting for extension paradox. Okay. Uh, and this is for compliers, but this additional thing is maybe we also want to understand if there is a way to estimate the bias induced by dropout. And independent of this, the dropouts are an issue. Dropouts are issue for every trial. So while sort of one would believe that randomized control trial is gold standard, yes, it is a gold standard, assuming nobody's dropping out and sort of uh, creating the biases. And in some sense, people are dropping out because of their own characteristics and the type character of the treatment that they're given. So understanding, so there is some kind of confounding happening. So how do we sort of uh, uh, overcome that as well? So those are the two questions. So just to summarize, right? Uh, two questions, uh, understand the outcome for all the 24 experiments is four treatment and six patient types. In particular, outcome would be average change in measurement for uh, patients in that group under that treatment. Okay. Uh, and the second one is understanding the bias induced by dropouts. For the first one, in principle, you could do six times four, which is four experiments. Question is that can we do the inference of all of those 24 experiments by actually having data access to much fewer than that? Okay. Can we do the same thing with by having actually not conducting 24 experiments, but only 12 experiments. Okay. Uh, putting it other way, what if uh, we had designed uh, a little bit more efficient experiment like this? That is, all the patient types get one treatment, is say drug zero, and then patient type one and two gets drug one, patient type three and four get drug two and patient time five and six get drop three, and the missing holes or cells are not observed. And then we would like to fill them up from these observations. So use observations for 12 experiment to uh, extrapolate to 24 experiment. Okay, and as it turns out in this setting, actually we had uh, enough data so that we had ground truth available. Okay, so let me sort of, uh, it's a good place for me to pause here. I'm roughly 15 minutes down. Uh, I was sort of set up the question, uh, see if there are any questions or clarifications about it. Okay, so 30 second Zoom pause and now I'm going to move on okay so now so that was a question now i'm going to sort of describe the uh, the method of synthetic interventions to answer the question okay okay so before i describe the method let's just zoom in a little to make sure that we understand what the data is okay so again we are setting ourselves up by giving method only access to this even we know that we have a ground truth of everything, okay? So that we can do cross validation. Okay, uh, what does method C? Method C is data associated with all the cells that have a check mark. What does a check mark here mean? Well, it means that for patients of type five, our treatment or corresponding to drug three, we know uh, the following, uh, uh, following data points, four covariates, two clinical measurements before the trial started and their age and gender. And then of course, five measurements, 
if they complied and they completed the trial. And if they dropped out, maybe less than five, maybe sometimes one, sometimes zero, sometimes two, sometimes four. Okay, and so in a sense, these are different individual patients and these are their uh, longitudinal data. If you think of not just one cell, but entire row, uh, the method sees the following type of data or we see the following type of data that the patients of type one, that's this one, type five, this one, and type six, this one. So five and six have checkpoints here, which means we see covariates and the clinical data, depending on compliers or dropout. And then as far as type one to four is concerned, these are empty boxes. So we don't see anything here. We see only these covariates. Okay. Just taking another example. Uh, if we have data for in the under the treatment two, we see information for type three and four, uh, both in terms of covariates and the clinical measurements for compliance all, drop out, miss some missing. Uh, but for other types of patients, we don't we see only the covariates. Okay. Now, similarly for drug one, again for drug one we have got type one and type two, but everything else there's no clinical information of the trials. Then finally, for drug zero, of course, we have data available for uh, uh, functions of type one to type six. And then sort of, of course, some of them are dropped out and some of them are compliers. Any questions so far? So now we know what the data is, right? Again, so it's a, um, okay, so for each, Treatment, we've got a matrix of data. Rows correspond to patients. Column corresponds to different measurements. Again, we've got matrices, one matrix for each treatment. Okay. And number of patients uh, corresponds to the number of patients that got drug zero uh, or drug one or drug two or drug three. Some of them are in type one, some of them are type two, and some of them are type six. Of course, the same patient doesn't get drug zero and drug two. Okay, but there is a patients of one type that may get uh, multiple drugs. Okay. So first thing we'll do is just let us inspect the data. Okay, and in particular, let's inspect matrix like this. Okay, so here um, what I'm doing is that inspecting the data for 28 complier patients who finished the entire trial uh, for their five clinical outcomes in the trial and they received drug zero, okay? And this matrix uh, full here actually has this uh, remarkable uh, spectrum. That is, if I plotted singular values, effectively it seems to suggest that it's rank one. Okay, that is all rows are just some kind of a multiplier of each other or columns. Now we can do the same thing for other group of patients who complied for the entire trial, uh, but under drug one, again, the same behavior. Uh, plotted spectrum, and effectively it seems to be a frank one. Now we can do the same for drug two and drug three. And as you would expect, it'll be rank one and rank one. It's remarkable. It remarkably load my data. Now, um, one could say that maybe sort of these things uh, are rank one, but they might be coming from sort of, uh, they might be sort of spanning different spaces, so to speak, right? To understand sort of whether they're spanning different spaces or same spaces, can we sort of try to understand that? One way to do that is to try to uh, uh, come up with what I would call concatenation of these things. Now to concatenate these things, um, because their dimensions are different across patients, because same patients don't get it, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some kind of aggregation. And again, it's, since it's a rank one, I'm not losing too much information doing that. So effectively what I'm going to do is I have data for drug zero, drug one, drug, and drug three, 
Okay, and now I'm going to look at data uh, where across patient types rather than individual patients. So I've got six rows, row corresponding to each of the patient type, and then five columns as before. And the entries, each entry, let's say row three, column two, corresponds to average across all compliers in uh, patient type three at time two or measurement two. Is that clear? Because all I'm doing is I'm just sort of aggregating across compliers for patient type. And hence it's number of patients, which is a patient type, which is six times five. Okay, now if I concatenate this mat these matrices like this, there's like four, four matrices, six rows and five columns. So it's a six by five times four, which is six times 20 matrix. And now I can sort of look at this fat matrix and it's look at its spectrum. And again, the fact that it remains rank one. Or them to suggest that at least uh, there is a, uh, uh, if I look at sort of one uh, type of subspace, which is columns, they're sort of still remaining the same. And I can do the same thing by folding across, uh, uh, across other dimension. That is five columns and six times four, which is 24 rows. And again, I do the, uh, the I plot the spectrum, because same as rank one, which means that the subspaces also across these different uh, treatments are remaining the same, which is quite, uh, uh, just a little bit surprising. But once you have this, then sort of at least gives us uh, uh, a method that sort of, uh, that can help us answer the questions that we're interested in. So now with this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of uh, go towards answering the question. In particular, going back to the one basic question, which was, let's say this cell is missing. What is it that I'm really trying to do? Trying to figure out for patient type one, and again, thinking of rows as patient types, one to six. For row one, for all five observations, I want to know what is the average or aggregate outcomes. Of course, I have observed nothing for patient type one and drug three. I have observed uh, for all patient types under drug zero, uh, patient type one uh, and two under drug one and so on. Those are the observation patterns or what I have seen here. From this, I want to sort of complete this row. Okay. So here is the method of synthetic intervention. And again, it's a, uh, it is natural generalization. One way to think about it is what's a method of synthetic controls. There are nuances and differences and I'll try to point them out. If you know synthetic control, you would know what the differences are. If not, uh, I would suggest, uh, or I would strongly encourage you to read beautiful uh, survey written by uh, uh, uh it's, it's a nice survey that shows out uh, uh, various uh, approaches and uh, utilize it in practice so on in terms of static controls. Okay, my mouse has stopped working, now it's back. So um, this is what we want to uh, uh, we want to estimate. The first, what we'll do is that well, let's go to the drug zero for which we know the observations for patients of type one. Okay, and let's look at what do we know about uh, what do we know about outcomes for drug three. Seems that we know that for patient type five and six the outcomes under drug three. So what I'm going to try to do is that I'm going to think of drug zero as a proxy of outcomes for drug three and try to learn a linear relationship between outcomes of patient type one as a function of patient type five and six. Precisely trying to learn a linear model that explains this row as a linear combination of these two rows. And since data is noisy, uh, we would try to denoise it. 
And the way we'll denoise it is we'll use uh, principal component regression. Okay. Once we learn this linear model, we'll now simply go to the drug tree and say, well, these two rows I know, I'm going to multiply them by the model I learned and then sort of estimate this. And that's it. Okay. Let me do one more, uh, one more such example. So let's, let's try to see and estimate what happens to patient type six under drug one. That is, I'm looking at seconds and trying to press last row. In the second slice, I have first two row. So what I really want to know is how can I express this last row as a linear function of the first two rows? And again, I will go back to the drug zero to do that learning. That is, let me look at the first two rows here and the last row and try to uh, express this as a linear combination of these two through uh, component regression or PCR. And whatever model I learned, use that to forecast it or predict it. And then, um, uh, of course, this is where we are sort of estimating the mean, like to have some confidence interval. And the will do the confidence interval is uh, uh, two norm of the vector we learn. Uh, the standard deviation we estimate is a simple method and is a script of T, and this is 95%. So I mean, the standard Gaussian. And that's it. So this is the method of uh, synthetic intervention. Right, let me see if uh, there are any questions and pause here if, if any. Okay. Right, three, two. No questions. I'm going to. Okay, so um, uh, just to point out, um, uh, this is just a one pattern for which synthetic intervention works, but uh, more generally, uh, an observation pattern where, for some treatment, we have for some columns, let's call it P zero, we observe outcomes for the units, which are rows, and then for some other observations. Okay, or some other uh, uh, outcomes. We want to know for each of the different treatment for each of the unit, what the outcomes would look like. And as long as you, for these measurements, for each treatment, some number of units for which we know comes, we can actually uh, do this uh, uh, prediction or counterfactual estimation. The key thing that we are doing here is that we're learning relationship between observations under one treatment, and we are trying to use the relation learned to extrapolate under other treatment. And in a sense, we are doing sort of a shame level transfer. So the question is that why should this transfer work? More generally, this begs the question of why should the synthetic intervention be? Now, before I answer that, just uh, I would like to make a quick note about the use of PCR here, super component regression. And basic point is that at the end of the day, as we also observed in this data set, and of course, this data set is amazingly low rank, it's rank one, but more generally the finite rank. And uh, one way to try to at least visually detect uh, uh, is just plot the spectrum of observed parts. There might be noise, and to remove noise, we do the PCA. So remove the keep the signal as a, a primary um, uh, component. The rest of them is noise. Remove that, and then do sort of ordinary least square. And this has a bunch of uh, nice properties. On one hand, it helps regularize it, uh, and hence generalize better. It makes it robust to noise and missing values, like uh, typical error and variable regression. There's a uh, work we have. Uh, that to explain that property. And in a sense, the type of property we are trying to use here is low rank. So one could sort of plot this as a spectrum and visually look at it or sort of normally write down conditions that sort of say whether this is a uh, low rank structure or not. 
All right, coming back to the case study before I move on to the why method works and explain it. Um, it is um, uh, normalized uh, uh, pretty accuracy uh, in terms of typical R. So what I'm doing here is that typical R squared, we do one minor thing. In numerator is the, always the prediction error of the method is what we have here. And denominator, so if you remember, all we did is that we express the outcome of our interest as a linear function of uh, other rows, right? If I did not sort of do any model learning, a simple estimator would be just take the average, sort of put uniform weight and what this is. Really, usually you do R squared comparison uh, evaluation with respect to reasonable, uh, no information uh, estimator and what this is, like size control over limited setting. And this is that. And of course, close to this being close to one is good. So other than this one X7 of subject type three and up to uh, the R square for most cases is 0.8 or above. Yeah. But uh, uh, at least we've pretty surprising. Just lo even looking at this, it turns out the enough data points here are four. So it's kind of not even clear as it's a signal or a noise. Okay. Uh, from aggregate setting, if we go to the individual patient trajectory setting and we use each patient's covariate information as the first four columns as a part of that method. Uh, here is uh, completely out of, uh, uh, out of sample or test prediction. So there's one patient whom we knew what uh, patient's co four covariates were, but nothing else. And then these were the clinical measurements in blue, actual measurement. And this was the light yellow is the, uh, is the uh, synthetic intervention prediction. And it's for same drug, different patients. And as you can see, there's a variation. So this is not, um, it's not like one average outcome. Uh, so uh, again, it seemed to be sort of able to predict them at the trajectory also really well. All right, so that's, uh, overview of an example case study and the method. Now what I want to do uh, is um, explain why the method works. And I forgot about so this, this chart that I had. The other question that sort of we asked is, what if uh, we would correct bias because of the dropout? Uh, and again, since we can do this kind of cross-validation, the confidence, if you believe in this method, then we can go back and look at all the patients that have dropped out for example, for drug one, if we see the change in the clinical score uh, or dropout is higher, it seemed to suggest that people dropped out because treatment was not working. Versus for drug two, it's really, uh, uh, pretty much uh, similar, which means that sort of maybe drug two was a, the people reason people dropped out uh, beyond that control. Again, it's hard to verify whether this is the right uh, thing for dropout because we don't have dropped out people, but the only closest cross validation we can do is for compliance. Okay, um, I'm 36 minutes down and let me spend the next 10 minutes or so just uh, briefly explaining why methods and what are the formulas this one can get and then sort of uh, slowly descend into some discussion slash uh, other words. So, Back to uh, the method, the key question is that why are we able to do uh, a model transfer between treatment to another treatment? And is it linear? So there's two parts of the linear and then the model transfer. And we're doing this even if potentially the observation might be confounded. So the question is that what is what of confounding uh, is, uh, is permitted when the transferring has been one linear shield. These are the questions. Okay, so uh, just lay on the basic uh, potential out framework for the setting. So remember we have N units, B interventions or trends. And for each of them, we are each unit under each 
uh, treatment, we observe or we are in T outcomes or measurements. And that's this random variable Y and T is potential outcome. That is, if ideally we knew every in the world, this would be the distribution or random variable that we'll be interested in. And in particular, um, think of this distribution on a variable as some mean plus reducing zero mean noise. Okay, this is the mean and the noise. Now, of course, um, as, uh, as I mentioned, but it's true, is, as Alberto, uh, uh, my colleague, sort of taught me, is, uh, there's a question that you ask and there's an answer to why there's a difference between them, right? That is, the question here is literally an ideal goal be to edit the entire distribution. Now, of course, it's a good question. We may not be able to answer that. And instead, we're going to sort of look at a simpler question. Let's just estimate the mean of the distribution rather than the distribution. Okay. Later, I'll try to discuss how we may be able to go from just mean to the moment, such as the, the variance of this. Okay. Um, in particular, here, we're interested in average across T for a given N and a given D. Okay, so average of quantities. Um, a more refined question would be that can we sort of estimate every N, T, and T itself, like uh, the individual treat back for in the time. Okay, uh, one way to visualize this or structure it is just a three order survey. The rows are units columns and measurements uh, in our case times, and then these different slices for a different intervention. And that sense was the structure I was used to uh, explore a case study. Uh, this is in uh, for a given patient or patient type at a given visit or given time, what is the outcome under drug one and so on. Okay. And now given this encoding, uh, the question of estimating this boils down to given partial observation of tensor, complete the observations of all ten, all observations of the tensor. Okay. And the patterns could be different as we discussed, but still I want to sort of uh, complete the measurements. Okay. Uh, so now the question is, okay, so, that's just an encoding. So far, I've not made any assumption. Now I'm going to start making assumptions to explain when does the model transfer or SI work. Okay, so first assumption is, well, uh, any three-order tensor, uh, you could write down its CP decomposition may not be unique. Um, and hence rank and rank may be large, like polynomially large in dimension. However, what we'll assume that rank is small, and that's an assumption one. Okay, so while this decomposition exists, we'll assume that the rank is small. That's assumption one. Uh, what this does is uh, something interesting. In particular, if we look at each slice of tensor, there's for a different intervention, you can rewrite this as U V transpose where U remains the same across slice, but V changes. Okay. And this U remaining same across the slice, what it effectively suggests is that there is, if um, each row of this U matrix corresponds to uh, effectively um, represents, corresponds to a unit. And if it's a small dimensional vector, let's say R dimensional vector and number of units are many, then in short, we can write a unit as a linear combination of other units, at least as far as this is concerned. And that effectively is what sort of enables the linear relationship in SI. Okay, so this is answering question why linear model. The next part is uh, the data generation process. Okay, and this is where I'm slowly now making steps. It's like three parts, right? Linear model, why model transfer happens, and what confounding. So explaining linear model. Now let me explain the what are the assumptions needed for other. So uh, one way to now look at the data generator or generative uh, version of the uh, 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 for this setup. Got latent factors associated with unit uh, measurement and intervention. This is my, the 
a mean potential outcome uh, tensor of my interest that I want to measure with this low rank. Now, I'm going to sort of uh, uh, reveal few of the entries of this tensor as an observation. And these observations correspond to a noisy observation like this. There's a mean tensor plus some adjacent credit cards. What I have not explained is that how did the how, how did D got chosen? What are the joint distribution of these things and so on? So here is just a DAG that tries to explain what that is. So given latent factor, the distribution of given latent factor, epsilons are independent conditionally. Okay, they are zero mean, but that distribution might depend on the latent factors themselves. Okay. Uh, given latent factor might determine which uh, entries that we have observed. Okay. And of course, latent Y is uh, mean plus epsilon, which means Y depends on latent factor and epsilon as shown here. The, in general, of course, one could have arrows from epsilons to D, and we're going to prevent that, and that's an assumption. Okay. Uh, so the confounding that is um, that respects this DAG is what we allow. Okay. Now one can ask question: Why is there confounding, and of what form? If you just recall, this is y, which is y equals to m plus epsilon, as we had, and there's a D. Now, because of their sharing latent factors, they're not independent. They're independent conditionally. Okay, and this is what uh, one would call uh, following the, uh, the notation on causal inference literature selection latent factors. And again, we are not the first ones to make such assumption or introduction of framework. This has been in the literature, for example, there's a nice work by Ethel and uh, Nathan Callister, where they have similar, uh, uh, similar sort of uh, framework or structural assumptions. All right. Um, so that was the second part. The third part, which in in fact uh, follows because of uh, the low rank structure, but I'll just sort of let me just precisely state it. Like, for example, if I'm interested in unit one, it's uh, some linear, uh, each latent factors are some linear function, uh, so uh, can be expressed a linear combination of latent factors of other units. Okay, and again, as, as I mentioned, if uh, these uh, latent factors are in R dimensional, then of course, this should hold if I sort of choose a unit one at random, for example, among N things, or indexing them randomly. But once that is there, then sort of uh, uh, potential outcomes under any D can be represented as a linear, uh, 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 same with same weights for um, the mean potential outcome associated with other units. And this is independent of D. And that's exactly the, what we do. That is, we learn the linear relationship under intervention one, for example, and try to extrapolate. Now, one would say that means that this is enough for doing model transfer. Well, we are doing model transfer under generalization, right? We are learning the model under observation. So that's what this is. We want to make sure that sort of model continues to remain ho hold true. And one way to express this is to say that the complexity of the observation here is no more than the complexity of observation here, or the subspace this thing span is contained inside that. And that's basically what uh, a simple linear algebraic condition and that's assumption four. So summarize, the reasons why SI would work at least one set of conditions are uh, four. One is low rank uh, tensor model, uh, the selection of latent factors, linear span and subspace inclusion. Now, as we discussed low rank, you can sort of plot the spectrum of the data and then verify this. If this is the case, effectively linear span follows. Subspace inclusion, well, you have two subspaces, you two observations, you can actually compute uh, their uh, corresponding, uh, the, uh, the subspaces that span, and then evaluate, ver verify whether this assumption is true or not. So all these three are effectively data-driven verification. As far as this is concerned, this is where, like any other causal inference setting, uh, the domain experts uh, understanding comes in, right? To say, well, 
in our example, indeed dropout were happening because of individuals is characteristic and then uh, the treatment. And that is effectively what this is encoding. But if that's not true, maybe then to one should not use. That is one nice thing about this is as we're putting it is uh, as a practitioner, you can decide whether this method should be applied or not in a meaningful manner. All right, now in a few minutes, I'll quickly rush through the formal results and then uh, spend maybe a few more minutes just explain, uh, discussing what comes next. Okay, so um, again, there are a few types of observation pattern. Highest level, you want to think of something that's observed for some amount of uh, measurements or time across all units and for a given treatment. And then something, some other observations for which you want to sort of estimate for everything else. In our example that we discussed, uh, both pre and pro, pro post, as I would call, was the same. But of course, there are different such patterns that's feasible. And what we really want to know is over this post interval for each unit under each treatment, what is the average effect? That's what this is. And that's the, that's the target causal parameter of interest. And for this, what we find is that um, effectively the error decays with these three quantities. Uh, how much of pre-intervention data you have, okay. how much of post-intervention data you have, and then sort of how many units for which you observe data under each of the treatments. In particular, here, specific treatment of interest. Okay. Um, now, one can ask the question, looking at this, saying, "Well, in the in the example we discussed, uh, I gave you a staircase pattern, right? There is for one treatment, everybody is observed, and others there is a staircase. Is that the best thing to do? Is there another um, another uh, observation pattern that one could have utilized? Well, um, if I had n units d treatment." Uh, and uh, with appropriate choice of T0 and T1, the synthetic intervention would say that you need these many observations independent of D. Of course, if you observed everything, uh, these many data points you would need. So definitely there's an improvement as there's a, a dependence on D is gone. But then one can ask the question, is this necessary? Can you reduce this? Uh, well, uh, uh, you can't reduce more than n times epsilon to power minus two. And we don't know whether sort of this epsilon to power minus two uh, uh, weakness of SI is necessary or is there a way to improve it? Okay. So this is something uh, of uh, uh, an interesting question of experimental design. Is there a way to sort of design upfront so that you can get as good as uh, any other method? Uh, there's a nice natural uh, uh, asymptotic normality associated with this estimator, and that leads to uh, uh, clean confidence intervals. Okay, and just to sort of uh, remind, subspace inclusion is important the way we set it up because if we don't have that, at least for this method, it would introduce bias. That's what this simple uh, empirical shows, uh, which suggests this clean hypothesis test for subspace inclusion, so that sort of look at the data, uh, compute uh, uh, low line representation of it, and then sort of compute appropriate statistics. It's so larger than a threshold, you reject it, or smaller than a threshold, you retain it. Okay, and there's a, a, a standard type of type to guarantee one can get. Okay, All right, so this is at least end of my uh, the formal part of the talk where I wanted to explain synthetic engine. Uh, now, maybe in remaining few minutes, uh, again, I'll look at Angela and Francesco if, if it is for me to go five more minutes or so. I guess it's fine. Yeah. Um, of course, if there are any questions uh, that folks have, I'm happy to take a pause here. I have a question. Uh, about sure. the analysis and the structure of the interventions. Can you sure. describe some of the challenges of the analysis that arise from this blockwise intervention structure relative to 
maybe traditional tensor completion, which maybe may have like uh, entries missing at random or completely at random type assumptions? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. Um, um, in particular, so there are two parts, right? Is the, the block by chair, and more importantly, what if the observations are confound the way that tags, right? Let me not to that slide, but we remember that. Um, so because of uh, the two things, uh, maybe uh, one is that the methods do rely on the fact that there is some form of, uh, uh, let's say, when you're sampling at random, there's some form of a sort of uh, expander-like structure in observation pattern. Uh, that is definitely messier. So in some sense, wants to do this kind of modeling that is somehow row-wise, it was very localized. Okay, so it's uh, so that's why use of PCR for each of the estimation and sort of using different linear model was very useful. The second part is just making sure that sort of confounding is not sort of distorting at least the estimation, and that's where. Just restricting yourself to full observation and missing values was very useful. So those are, I think, the two really interesting challenge. Uh, more generally, just trying to figure out what all sorts of patterns uh, that are induced um, as per DAG that still enable uh, uh, completion of tensor-driven matrices. That something is really an in question. We have some partial answer in the that companion that I mentioned, but uh, again, I, I think it's a super interesting question. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So just um, uh, again, let me sort of give you one perspective of what really happened in the this work. So if we go back like the traditional causal inference one of right? uh, this is what is usually an outcome of it. D is the invention that the entry understanding uh, under which what outcomes may lie. And there's always some confounder, uh, confounder partial, sometimes fully observed, partially observed. Okay. And what happens is really, of course, impacts the outcome, but it may also impact the, the intervention. Ignoring noise and all, uh, this style of structure would suggest relation something like there was some function of u and d. Again, v may be a function of u. Can be observed data as well, this, this uh, relationship, this structural model, and then we want to figure out things like uh, at a population level for a given d, you want to figure out under u where u is chosen as per population as outcome. Or, for a given unit or given individual, which is characterized by given context to you, every D worked out. So that's like an individual level uh, uh, treatment effect. Okay. Um, we could answer potentially of these if we know what the functions G and F are and maybe the U is associated with individuals too. Then you choose D. You choose do you and you have, you apply it and that's it and then it's like traditional prediction problem. Problem is data is uh, first of all dependent the way we observe. We don't have sufficient observation uh, because for a given you you may observe and only under intervention or two but not both. And many times you is latent. Okay, I'm just assuming that what we observed is 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 very questionable. Uh, uh, assumption in general. So how does one go about doing this? At least in this high dimensional setting where, you know, for each unit, we had lots of observations. Uh, in effect, a factorization like this suggests that, well, for a given unit, I may not know my U precisely, but I can express it as a linear combination of other units, right? Uh, the Vs, okay, Vs that were observed for some measurement would go to another measure. But subspace illusion like uh, assumption helps you sort of say, well, the model continues to hold and there is an operation observation that you have. And more generally, even this factorization, selection on latent factor assumption if I says that there is just like amount of independence, not too much uh, and not too little. So, 
had somehow sort of enabled by passing all the challenges that he had here in terms of uh, not able to learn F or not able to learn U. Okay. Um, and then uh, I guess in remaining maybe 30 seconds, I'll just sort of talk about a few things that, uh, that uh, we've been working on. Uh, so like, looks like my... Um, just looking back, uh, now assuming that solve a generic tensor estimation like this, the subject is uh, uh, causal assumption. Uh, things like problem like the regression regression discontinuity design, are, uh, you know, uh, there are many uh, policies such as people get Medicare only after that turn 65, right? So it's a function of uh, things like age. Turns out that if we could solve a generic tensor estimation problem, we, we might be able to solve regression discontinuity design, you know, not just at the discontinuity that is understanding effect of 65, but maybe at all ages. And they're quite amazing because these are, uh, these are very pervasive uh, policy implementation rules. Um, building on this, uh, uh, one could use this method uh, as a black box you know, multiple times to actually estimate variances of potential outcome and variances are different across each unit time and one unit. Uh, if the temporal dependence and factors associated with measurement time, one could use that to extrapolate to do causal forecasting by going from three order to four order tensor. And then if we had actual observed covariates, I never understand whether the weights have anything to do with the outcomes that we are interested in. We learn the latent factors. Now let's try to learn under relationship between that. And that could at least explain something. So, um, and this last one is, I'll just uh, leave this, is uh, this factor model we try to utilize to do uh, offline uh, RL, if we can sort of learn it in a data efficient manner. And here is an example. It's a, it's a nice thing about this weird thing that you can actually see what it is. And the thing is, this is what comes out of uh, the method is, the black is the, the true trajectory of the thing, and the uh, is the model thing, and state of art rules that unfortunately don't do when data is very limited, versus this method-based factor model as well. Okay, so with that, uh, let me sort of you with this one last thing, that is, I think, this type of sort of tensor view provides a way to also ask questions related to trade off between uh, computation and statistical uh, uh, guarantee causal inference. And really, uh, I think we engineers should start utilizing causal inference more and contribute more to causal inference. So, with that, let me sort of stop here and see if there are any questions. I know I've gone a little bit above my time. So, Sorry about that. Uh, I, I had a question. Um, first, thanks for yeah. a really nice talk. Um, I really appreciated the way that you thanks. made all the assumptions uh, very explicit and clear. That was really appreciated. Um, but my, my question is about, so in this setup, you kind of received a design matrix with covariates and knew that, uh, like you said, the treatments were assigned randomly, but not uniformly. And I'm wondering, uh, and then you gave like conditions on when um, this kind of treatment is good and like what's the optimal way to do this to like have efficient ways to assign treatment. But it seemed like in, in at least your particular example, you almost got like a black box from the company of how they assigned treatments based on these covariates. Is that the case? And I guess like, is that, standard and do you think that there's like benefits that could build on to your method if you had some more than black box information about how treatments were assigned from covariates? Just to sort of paraphrase your question, Blair, um, the question is that uh, in the sort of study I described, there was a randomized assignment, of course not uniform, okay. Uh, would uniform have helped and slash R would my knowledge of how this precise assignment happened, would that have helped, right, the, in the method? Now, um, 
the short answer is that at least uh, this method does not sort of utilize uh, how the assignments have happened uh, perfectly in a sense because it wants to avoid the effect of uh, confounding, right? And confounding if I really say is that sort of how assignments, what observations you have seen, you want to uh, get away from that, remove the biases induced by that. Uh, so for that reason, this method at least would not utilize that kind of information. Now, one can ask question, would there be sort of a method where you know this precisely and then that can sort of help you decide things? Potentially, yes, especially in the traditional tensor matrix estimation, you want to make sure that right sorts of things are observed and not the wrong sets of things. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? I have a question. So you mentioned uh, more of kind of feature work extensions, um, looking towards kind of higher order tensors or higher order moments of the potential outcome. And I was wondering, do you have a sense of anticipating some of the statistical or computational trade-offs involved with these higher order moments and the higher order tensors? Absolutely. So I think uh, uh, definite. Okay. So let's let's take example of this one. Okay. And how were, how would one go about sort of, uh, uh, okay, so if you remember uh, the model is that we've got the potential outcome, which is mean plus epsilons. Uh, epsilons are zero mean, but I want to now they have a variance. Variance might be again, function of latent, uh, uh, latent uh, features associated with unit time and intervention. To estimate that, if they satisfy a low rank or approximate low rank structure, then what we'll do is that we'll first estimate the mean tensor, remove it from the observed uh, entries, square it, and then sort of apply the same method again. Okay, and that means that for each stage, one has to do uh, tensor estimation. And uh, that means that one has to sort of uh, twice now uh, has to overcome uh, this challenge of computation. So unless the pat if patterns are at uh, random or at least in this kind of uh, setting, if you do, if you try to, sorry, I had that slide here somewhere. Yeah, here. Uh, uh, that for at least n by n by n uh, tensor, we do know that uh, at least subject to the computational hypothesis that n raised to three by two is uh, some kind of a lower bound and whether we got pattern like this or like this, I don't think we can overcome that. Okay. All right, uh, so looks like, uh, thank you everyone for staying more than sort of uh, 4 p.m. and uh, asking questions, listening to the talk. And uh, I guess this should be the end of the session, right?